Welcome to episode 30 of the Silver Savage podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Masada Tactical. If you live in the Maryland area and would like to try some classes, take advantage of our New Year special, which includes a free month and free personal training session with either Steve or myself. In this episode, Steve and I sit down with Dr. Eric Nager, who you may remember from episode number two, I believe, to chat about incidents that seem to happen to us a lot more than probability should have it. Medical emergencies on a flight. We discuss what are some of the more probable events and what you can do to help if needed. Here's episode 30 with Dr. Nager. Hold on, I'm pressing record and we are live. So any anything stupid you say right now is being recorded. I think Cheers. everything that comes out of my mouth can and be can and will be held against me in the court of law. So so for the record, Steve and I just taught our first kids class at uh, Masada Tactical and I caught home and Isabella uh, asked me if I want a drink. And I said, yes. And she goes, how many fingers? And I go, as many as you have. Yeah, it's funny you said that because as I was pouring my glass, I'm like, how many fingers do I want? And I'm like, I'm thinking a fist. Yeah, right. <laughs> Man, kid, teaching kids is tough. <laughs> but you know what? Um, our friend Ernie once told me that the beauty of Krav Maga, he said, if you cannot teach Krav to kids, then you should not be teaching Krav at all. I mean, the principles should be so simple that you should be able to explain it to a child. I had a blast. Right? Uh, it, it was different. It was fun. It was different. And it certainly requires me a lot of concentration to control and put my filter on. In my yeah, yeah, but that's why I was there too. I mean, for me, it was like I'm finally with people that I, are at my academic level. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. is very true. All right. So uh, let's get into the uh, the meat of this. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Eric Nager with us, who has been with us in the past. Uh, but for a completely different topic, last time we had uh, Eric on, uh, we were talking about uh, optimizing performance and talking about hormonal therapy for men our age and so forth. But today's podcast is actually triggered by a few events that Steve and I had. So we mentioned last week about you know us being sheet magnets. Turns out that it follows us around. And uh, at least twice on flights with Steve and at least twice without Wait, Steve. Shit or the magnet? Both. You, know, you have shrapnel in my body, so the magnet would follow me around. <laughs> Fair. Um, no, but at least uh, at least twice that we were together, and we're going to talk about one specific event, um, actually two. And then since then, I had one more up and without you, and I had one in the past. Where we are on a flight, and you hear one of those, if there is a doctor on flight, can you come to the galley or towards the cockpit or whatnot? Which I and hate I'm, when you say that first. Right. And you know what the funny thing is? So I'm going to get ahead of myself. Steve and I are sitting on this flight and they're like, is there a doctor? Nobody stands up. So they started lowering the standards. Is there a nurse? <laughs> is there an EMT? Is there anybody that played doctor as a kid? You know. <laughs> so eventually we got up. But uh, but let, actually, let me, before we even get started, I, I do want to make a couple things clear. First of all, we are not giving any medical advice. We're going to talk about our experience. We're going to chit chat with Dr. Neger about these experiences, but we are not giving medical advice, nor are we uh, recommending anybody does anything. And this is just general information and people should know their own scope of abilities, uh, legality, liability, and they should act according to their best, um, I guess, what they think is right. The other thing I want to make sure is because we in the past talked a lot about uh, medical elements associated with dignitary protection, which are specific to your principal and what medical issues they have or not have and how to prepare for those. And also talked about medicine abroad. So when we are at a destination and inter typically we discuss that internationally, since things are different than they are in the U.S., uh, today we're specifically sticking to you're on an airplane and you get that call. What do you do? So to give the background on the, the event that uh, Steve and I had, it was, it was a lady, um, elderly lady who passed out. Uh, when we got to her, we ruled a few elements out, turned out to be a diabetic related um, event and orange juice solved the problem. She was back. She was super grateful. Show me. Uh, and everything was great. Uh, one event prior, Steve and I were on a flight, international flight, where it was a cardiac event. And aspirin seemed to have helped. And uh, we actually ended up landing in Frankfurt, where that passenger was taken up. Um, and then since then, I had one more event, but they were 
apparently uh, if you come from Florida, there's a shitload of doctors, most of them Jewish on the flight. So I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> so with that in mind, um, Eric, uh, you and I got on the phone after I got back from this flight with Steve and I said, Eric, this is what happened. I carry a trauma kit with me. You know, lesson learned since 9-11. I've turned kit, chest sales on me at all times. But if somebody has a medical emergency, not a trauma-related emergency, I'm very unprepared. And you and I went through a process. We had a good discussion, probably about 45 minutes on the phone and going, on what would be some of the more common possible events on a flight? And what can we carry? Uh, what would TSA allow? What can we carry from, uh, you know, not being physicians? Uh, what, what kind of medicine, if at all, should we have on us? And what's the appropriate treatment? So, so I'm going to give it to you. I mean, tell, tell us a, bit, a little bit about your experience. I think you mentioned to me that you had one such event happen to you at least on a flight before as well, right? Yeah, you know, as, as an emergency physician, which was my training for many years before I transitioned into functional medicine, you, you dream of those magic words. Is there a doctor on the plane, right? Because like you're so poised and ready and ready to jump at any of these emergencies. And it's, uh, it's incredibly rare. It, it just doesn't happen. Like, you know, in the ER, obviously, I was dealing with that day in and day out. When you get on a plane or you're in a restaurant, um, those magic words to an emergency physician's ears generally do not happen. Uh, fortunately, actually, which is a good thing. Um, but Apparently, if you're look, not a physician like Steve and I, it happens all the time. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> right. You guys are the right kind of magnets. So, um, you know, what, what you want to think about is common things, because it's really going to be the common things that happen in real life that is what's going to happen on a plane. So um, I know you sort of gave away sort of the ending of your story talking about a, a blood sugar emergency. But what will often happen is they'll have somebody. One typical thing would be, say, altered mental status. So you're on a plane. Um, you know, generally the plane is in flight for some period of time. And then that's when you're going to hear that announcement go off. Uh, and it's usually because somebody has an altered mental status. So what are the possible reasons why someone could have altered mental status on a plane? And, you know, again, you just want to think about the common things that can happen. So, uh, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to slow you down for a second. I'm sorry. Just for those uh, listeners that do not have a medical background like us, what would you consider an altered mental, mental status? What does that mean to them? Yeah, because somebody like my norm. So let's explain that. Yeah, because right. just full retard all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll back it up and I'll, I'll try to tone it down a little bit. So altered mental status would basically be anybody acting in a way that's different from what you would perceive as normal. So somebody, you know, what would be normal? You know, somebody having normal conversations, um, having uh, a certain level of alertness. I don't think any of us would think it would be abnormal for somebody to be sleeping on a plane. But for instance, if somebody started acting goofy, right, they started um, being very loud, being argumentative, um, being um, inappropriate, uh, any of those things might signal you that the person is having an altered mental status. Or it could be that they were previously alert, and now all of a sudden, they're no longer alert. They are, um, uh, they were talking one minute, and all of a sudden, they're snoring, and you can't wake them up. So it might, you know, all of those could encompass an altered mental status. And um, so you start thinking about what, what, what could be the causes? Well, you know, number one thing I'm thinking of on a plane is booze, right? Especially if it's first class, right? So a lot of people are anxious about flying. Um, you know, they've had a bad day at Masada teaching kids. And the next thing you know, they're, they're enjoying a little bit too much bourbon, right? And, and then things get out of hand. They can get, you know, we've all ran into it right at a bar. They could be argumentative. They could be incredibly um, uh, inappropriate. They could be very sleepy. They could be snoring and unarousable. So the first thing I'm thinking about is, you know, is there alcohol involved? And an easy way, if you're just, a, you know, if you're a good Samaritan and you're somebody that, that has limited medical training, it could be something as simple as turning to the stewardess and saying, how many drinks did that guy have? Okay, well, if the guy had, you know, is pounding him the whole time, you probably have an answer. Um, if the stewardess says, well, he hasn't had one drink, okay, well, now you got to start thinking about other things. So you don't have to be a medical professional to start sussing some of this out. So, and, and when we deal with someone 
that had a ridiculous amount of alcohol to where they are passed out. Really, dancers just let them slip it off. They're not a threat to themselves as long as the airway is open and they're not going further in than just watch them, make sure they're fine and let them be right until you land. There's nothing else to do. Not much to do, right? It's one thing if the person is having trouble breathing. Like you said, you could put them in a recovery position. You could put them in a sniffing position, which is essentially just taking their chin. What do you got there in your hand? I'm, I'm not seeing that. Nose trumpet. Uh, okay. Well, w you could certainly do that. <laughs> but there are some there are some less invasive things that you can do first that work. I stick work. one in. That's that's my go-to. All right. Well, there you go. I stick one in. <laughs> I'm going to put that on your tombstone. Um, Wait, um, take it in? <laughs> <laughs> so a simple, you know, jaw thrust or chin lift, which is essentially where you just take your thumb right underneath the chin and you put them into what's called sniffing position, which opens up the airway. So if they're snoring really loudly, that may get the soft tissue out of the air, out of the airway so they can breathe more effectively. Um, if that doesn't work, BK was holding up what's called a nasopharyngeal airway. Um, it is a, uh, essentially Steve is holding an oral one just to uh, for those that are now watching the video um, two different ways of maintaining an airway open um, the oral one is more susceptible to gag reflex which is why it is typically not the go-to but it does have advantages specifically if you're dealing with head trauma uh, compared to the nasal one so sorry doctor no no worries so you're 100 percent right so it's made out of the, the one that steve is holding is made out of rigid plastic it's inserted into somebody's mouth. Usually we have it in a U-shaped fashion when we're putting it in, and then we rotate it so that it follows the course of the tongue and gets the tongue out of the way. Um, what BK was holding up is usually a soft, pliable, you know, for lack of a better term, like a rubber hose that is inserted into somebody's uh, nose, into their nair, and usually using lubricant. So you've got to have some KY jelly there to lub lubricate it. Um, if... You know, if you're a paramedic or someone who's trained in this, one of the things that I've always taught is sometimes it's difficult to get that into someone's nose. So it, it helps to have a pair of gloves. You put some lubrication on the glove. You would then put the gloved finger into the person's nose and hold it in there. And the idea behind that is it helps to dilate and open things up so it makes it a little easier. Because the last thing you want to do is jam that in somebody's nose um, without lubrication. And then you took what was, you know, somebody that maybe had a little bit of too much booze and is snoring. Now you've turned it into a, a nightmare of a nosebleed. And that's kind of the last thing that you want. You don't want to make more problems than, than, than you're solving. So I'm going to stop you. Sorry, Doc. I'm going to end up stopping you a shit lot of times because uh, I have a lot of stories, right? So when I went through... I'm going to treat you, so don't piss him off. What was that? But don't piss him off. He's still going to treat you. He is, and he goes out my butt about every four months. <laughs> I'm a little but jealous. That's a, <laughs> that's a different story. Everybody should refer to episode two, I believe, either one or two, I can't remember, with Eric Nager. But <laughs> um, when I went through my EMT school in the U.S., um, when we got to you know the airway management chapter, the instructor said, well, we had a Navy SEAL here the other day, and he stuck in, well, in his own nose. So I would never be outdone by a Navy SEAL. That's just a rule. So I, my question was, was it lubricated? And the guy said, yes. I'm like, well, I'm going to go dry. And there's a video of me sticking a dry NPA up my nose and pulling it out. So not that I recommend that to anybody, but yeah, just saying. Disclaimer. <laughs> disclaimer. <laughs> Sorry, Doc. Keep going. <laughs> Doc, you still, uh, still with us? Doc, you muted. So I'm going to read Doc's lips. <laughs> well, that would be interesting. Right? Hold on. Um, for those that are not watching, Doc, Dr. Neger is actually in his car. He pulled over in order to have this conversation with us. Hopefully in a safe place. It looks like a creepy dark alley. It's probably Baltimore, but that's okay. If anybody could handle themselves, it's... Yeah, it'll Dr. be Dr. Neger. Neger. Okay. Yeah. Well, while we, while he's working these technical difficulties, because I think it's showing no audio right there on, on him. Um. I know you talked about having your own pouch. I have my own pouch, and after the conversation you had with Nate, I kind of realized right. myself. So I put one based on my conversation with Eric a few weeks back, and I'm going to go over the content once we get to the, that point with uh, with Eric. But I, I use a back. pelican. Huh? I'm checking to see if Doc's back on. And he's gone. Doc hung up, and Doc is going to hopefully log back. Come back on. <laughs> We'll find out in a second. 
Oh, he's texting that he has no audio. Sign language, Doc. Sign language. No? How about I remove him and log him back in? That might work. Um, in the meantime... Doc, I'm kicking you out. All right, hopefully. <laughs> this is a great time to sip on whiskey. Yep. So... That's that uh, altered mental status theory. Doctor, are you back with us? No? All right. So we're going to keep going just because we don't have... So, so you know, Dr. Nagin mentioned alcohol being um, a prime example of something that can uh, alter someone's mental status. The other one is what we dealt with, which is um, low blood sugar, right? Uh, which oftentimes manifests itself in altered mental status. And uh, one thing that Dr. Nagin recommended to me at the time was to have a glucometer, a uh, little gadget that you can buy at uh, any pharmacy that will allow you to measure someone's blood uh, sugar levels, right? I keep looking at Doc, and it's throwing me off because I can't hear him. I know. He's kind of staring there trying to figure the problem out. Yep. As sexy as he is, it's, uh, it's a little creepy. But um, so in my kit, like you said, I, I it's funny because we talked about a, a small travel kit that you can have. Specifically, we were talking about in flight. So I've always had this this bag. I call it my ouch pouch. It's not my, my uh, trauma bag. But in here, I have the things we talked about, the more common, you know, medical issues, right? You know, I have a glucometer, I have glucose, I have, you know, um, epinephrine, I have um, um, uh, pulse ox, you know, all those little things. Do you have a pulse ox in there? Yes, I do. Um, um, but I never thought I could bring all this stuff on an aircraft, Right, so a lot of it you can. So one of the things we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, Dr. Neger recommended an EpiPen. Now, I don't have a prescription for an EpiPen, and I can probably get one, but it is it does have a needle in it. So if you do not have a prescription, can you take out on the fly with you? And in my checks with TSA, I got very conflicting information depending on who you asked, right? So that was an issue. So while we're waiting on Dr. Nager, I actually went the smaller route. I figured I'm not going to need more than this. So I'm using a Pelican case, a 1040 Pelican case. It's probably about uh, three inches by six inches. Uh, hard plastic, so it just goes in my carry-on. I don't need to carry it separately. Um, and in it, if we talk about the diabetic event, which is what we dealt with, we asked for orange juice, and most flights would have it. Uh, but what I got is actually... So you actually have the uh, medical glucose. I just got this um, athletic. Over the counter, um, yep. It's essentially yep. the same thing. Exactly. So it's just over the counter. And what I'm talking, I think, doctor is trying. I'm back. You're, you're oh, back. Right. All right. We kind of moved on from alcohol to diabetics because we didn't know what to say about alcohol anymore. No we worries. We like it. We're pretty much alcoholics ourselves. We, <laughs> I we, hear you. We don't want to put ourselves down. <laughs> All right, sorry, sorry. There was some kind of technical glitch. I signed back in. So, what did I miss on diabetics? No, but no, real quick, just to wrap something up with the person that's passed out. And I know we talked about if if we can determine that they are under the influence of something and this uh, exhibiting that altered mental status, let them sleep it off, right? Wrap them in yep. duct tape, blindfold them, and let them sleep it off. Um, but one thing I carry in my kit, um, BK, is ammonia tablets. Okay. Oh. So I know it's not typically a common thing, but I always have these two, you know, smelling. What do you use that for? To wake people up. Why would you want to wake them up? I'm just curious. Well, that's what I'm saying. Aside from the drunk person. All right. And, and, and again, I've used these as a diagnostic tool. Um, you know, like if you snap one underneath the nose and they don't respond to it, then obviously there's something underlying that's even more um, complicated that you have to use. Kind of like have to repeat all of that because I lost you. Did you hear me? I can hear you just fine. I hear him. Yeah. You're just frozen in time, but we can hear your angelic voice. Um, so it's it's more of a diagnostic tool, kind of like using Narcan as a diagnostic tool, right? If they don't wake up from it, then you know it's not an opioid uh, or you, um, it's not something opioid related. So it's just one of those things that I use as a quick, cheap diagnostic tool. I've used it in the past as a diagnostic tool. So what I would say, I Steve, about that, that on, on an airplane I'd be careful about it only because since it's just enclosed, uh, the chance of it like causing problems with other folks is magnified. Yeah, and that's um, what, that's what we need to hear. Like I, yep. I uh, before we lost you, Doc. Um, like I said, uh, I you you and BK had the conversation, and I'm like, oh wow, I have this stuff already, 
in my travel bag. This is my ouch mm -hmm. pouch that never yeah. leaves my car. It goes in my bigger bag. And I've never thought that I could bring any of this stuff on an aircraft. And then you had that conversation with VK. So these are the things that we want our viewers to hear. Ammonia tablets, probably, it's like using OC spray in a confined space, right? Correct. You don't want that overpowering, you know, um, chemical affecting other people because now you're, you're magnifying your problems. So you know, although I've used it in the past, now I know I, that's probably one of the things I don't want to have on my airplane kit or my in-flight, you know, medical emergency kit. Right. Yep. And yep. doctor, let, let's go to the other extreme. If they're overly belligerent, so if you have a person that the alcohol affects them in an adverse manner, right? So instead of passing out, they're just so obviously Steve and I would just have to throat punch them and tie them to the chair. But <laughs> is there anything else that you <laughs> would recommend? Uh, no, I mean, the reality of it is, is obviously in the ER, we dealt with, you know, pretty um, aggressive uh, drunks all the time. So this was not an uncommon problem. Um, so what you obviously, you know, first of all, you know, verbal judo, right? You try to deescalate because you're in a confined space. It's not going to be pretty if you have to throw a punch them and everything else. Now, clearly you can go the, the Steve route and duct tape them and whatnot. That's certainly a possibility. If all else fails. Yeah, well, but I would say that the thing that sometimes will work and clearly it's not all the time is de-escalation um so just you know they call that verbal judo right just trying to de-escalate as much as you can if it if it can't then obviously you know you go a different route but there's really no magic solution to that other try other than trying to ramp things down sometimes what will happen is they're overstimulated and that just ramps up the, the bad behavior so i think um uh just try you know if, like if they're sleeping let them sleep i would not wake them up with ammonia i would just let them be um, just like BK said, because you don't you don't need more problems. But with the belligerent guy, probably not much. Yeah, okay. and, and, and not to change course, but this is you know for our viewers as, as the civilian or you know whoever who's being the good Samaritan to help. You know, always ask first if 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 it's an aggressive person. Ask if there's an air marshal on board. Most flights have air marshals now. Uh, most of the times they'll keep their you know persona um, hidden for more extreme situations and typically not you know, um, expose themselves to stuff like this, but why put the liability on yourself? You know, if there's a, a armed federal air marshal on board, let them take it on. Um, I just want to throw that out there because I have friends that are air marshals. So thank you, Steve. So let's, uh, let's move on to the diabetic event. Cause that's really probably in my mind, the second most likely cause for an altered mental status on a flight, right? People didn't need enough, got to a, a red eye flight or something like that. And then go into a low blood sugar, or, you know, uh, they have a pre-existing condition that leads to a diabetic episode, right? So depending on which type of diabetic uh, they are. So in my talks with, uh, with you, Eric, you, uh, you mentioned uh, a glucometer, which people can mm -hmm. buy. Uh, you don't need a prescription for it. it. They're fairly small nowadays. You can buy it in pretty much any pharmacy. You will spend, I, I priced it anywhere between 50 to real low end one to about $250, $300 to higher end one. Uh, but really, I think they all will do pretty much the same thing. And then you recommend it. Well, actually, before we move on to what you recommend to deal with it, what are numbers that are people looking at? Sure. Or looking so for what BK is talking about is a glucometer. And what that is, is it's a device that measures blood sugar in real time. So uh, you have usually there's three parts to that. One of them is like a little finger sticker. Um, it's essentially... Um, it's a plastic device with a plastic ball on the end. You twist it off and there's a little needle at the end of it. It's not enough to like do physical harm to anyone. So I don't see them taking this away on a flight. And you can just say, hey, look, my blood sugar goes low. I need to check my finger stick. So they'll let you on because it's a medical device. Essentially, what you'll do is you'll then take that device. You, you prick the finger to draw some blood. The best place to do it on a finger is usually on the side. You don't want to do it straight into the pad of the finger, usually on the side of the finger. Uh, then you milk the finger up, you get a little drop of blood, and then there's a blood strip that you have to touch to the blood. The blood goes into the strip, and then you put it into the glucometer. Um, depending on the device, it can be anywhere from you know a few seconds to up to a minute, and it will give you a readout of what their, at their blood sugar is. For normal, quote-unquote, normal blood sugar levels are 70 to 100. So when it starts getting below 70, it could indicate what's called hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, which can cause altered mental status, sleepiness. But interestingly, it can also tend to get people quite aggressive. Some people will, it'll simulate somebody who's like a, like an, you know, like an aggressive drunk, for instance. Um, once blood sugars start to get below 50, that's when you start seeing 
signs of hypoglycemia. And that can vary everything from lightheadedness, dizziness, or like we said, altered mental status. Um, when it starts to get really low, 40, 30, 20, that's when you probably need to take some action and when their mental status is really going to be altered. Higher blood sugars um, are anything above 100. Generally speaking, your blood sugar has to get super high before someone has altered mental status. By super high, what do I mean? Um, usually three, four, 500 or even higher before somebody acts in a way that would be altered. Perfect. And you mentioned that the easiest solution, I mean, in our case, we, we use orange juice. You, you really would just want something with sugar to try to elevate an hypoglycemic patient. And even if they are hyperglycemic, giving them more sugar is not going to make things any worse. So when in doubt, right, giving them rather than not giving them is the way to go. Am I correct on that? Generally speaking, yes. And and this is where it, taking a little bit of a history and taking a couple of minutes to sort of decipher what's going on. And again, if there's a family member with them, it makes life real easy. Is this person diabetic? Um, oh, they are? Okay. Did they eat today? They didn't eat? No. When's the last time they ate? Start asking questions like that is, you know, because if they say, oh, yeah, you know, they had a good lunch, they had a good breakfast, the chances of them being hypoglycemic are slim. Um and uh, I encountered this once. I was uh, on a car ride back from New York. Uh, the guy driving um, hadn't had anything to drink, and it was late at night. And um, he's basically falling asleep at the wheel. And he goes, I think my blood sugar is dropping. And I said, well, wh what do you mean? What do you mean your blood sugar is dropping? We just, had, like, the, we just ate like kings at this barbecue place. <laughs> what are you talking about? He ate so much, and he ate, unfortunately, a lot of high-sugar foods. His blood sugar was sky high, and it was causing him to get lethargic. Um, and he was falling asleep at the wheel. So we pulled over at a rest stop, we got him water, and we had him hydrate aggressively. And what that does is that dilutes the blood sugar, brings the blood sugar down in a very safe way without an IV. Um, and within, I'd say, an hour of him chugging the water, his mental status was completely back to normal. He was alert and oriented, uh, but it was bizarre. Um, so that's where taking a history can be very, very valuable. So talk to the people around him. Find out, did they eat? Did they not eat? If there's no family member, talk to the stewardess. Did, did you serve them any food? If that person was drinking orange juice or having, you know, any of the normal treats that they give you on an airplane, again, it's it. You start thinking about maybe blood sugar being elevated as opposed to being lower. If, um, yeah, so that's kind of how that's some of the detective work I might do before giving them anything. Perfect. And one of the things you recommend is obviously having something with glucose. And I went ahead and bought these goo things that athletes use, right? So there's 15 grams of glucose in this little. Uh, power. So now in my, my little Pelican case that I made after we talked, I have three or four of those in there. Uh, just as a quick way to get some sugar in them, uh, I think fairly effectively, pretty much simulating what medical uh, glucose tube would do, correct? Yeah, and, and that's a nice little trick. If you know Those are great to have. If for some reason you haven't packed them or you forget them, in a pinch, use what you've got around you, right? You're on a plane. They've got tons of glucose laden things that won't cause an airway problem. So, you know, orange juice comes to mind. Um, but in a pinch, you could just take a couple packets of sugar, put them in cold water, stir it around and slowly let them sip that, you know, pour it into their mouth. Um, you, you don't want to create a situation where you occlude their airway or block their airway. So you don't want to be stuffing food down there. That would be a big mistake. So, not, you know, not feeding them sandwiches or candies or stuff that could cause them to choke. Perfect. Thank you. So some of the other things that we discussed is kind of moving down the list. Um, one thing that I was concerned about, always concerned about, is an allergic reaction. I mean, I know that um, on the flights we've been on, they give you everything that has nuts in it and so forth. And obviously, people that are allergic would be aware of it and typically would have an EpiPen or stay away from such stuff. Sometimes they don't or sometimes there's a delayed reaction to something. And if they have an allergic reaction to anything, um, EpiPen would be great, but EpiPens are super expensive, uh, and if you don't have a prescription, it's hard to get. I also I mentioned to Steve while you were off, I, I reached out to a couple of uh, people I knew that work with TSA or in TSA, and I got mixed reviews as to whether or not you'll be able to take it on a flight because of the needle in it. Um, if you do not have the prescription for it, it may be a little tricky and a little problematic. So just something to keep in mind, be willing to lose that EpiPen if you do not have the prescription and you're dealing with a TSA agent, that's a little bit more, you know, aggressive in his approach. Uh, but another thing that you mentioned to me was maybe Benadryl capsules. 
Um, right. One one caveat about that EpiPen. Um, my understanding is that all of the airplanes have a medical uh, pouch, and they do have medications on board. Now, I'm not. I am by no means. Uh, an expert on this, but I'm almost positive that they have a cache of different medications. And I would be surprised if they didn't have epinephrine in there. That may be something that like an EpiPen or something like that might be something that's in there. And that's, um, of course, that's just conjecture on my part, but I think there's a possibility. No, if, so you're right in that sense. And actually, um, I don't know if you know our other friend, Dr. Pacino, she sent us uh, a list of what TSA or uh, FAA actually uh, states that should be on a flight. But I'll tell you from our experience, when we asked for anything, we got an oxygen tank, a portable small oxygen tank, and that was pretty much it. They had a blood pressure cuff. We got a blanket. Um, too. We did get a blanket, uh, but that was it. They, If they had something on the flight, the flight attendants did not know where it was. There was no access to anything else. So, yes, you're right in the sense that it should be there, mm -hmm. but I would caution our listeners from uh, assuming and trusting that that would actually be available when they need it. So just something to think about. Yep. So that's, that's good to know. As far as the EpiPen is concerned, for reasons that are not completely clear, um, and we tend to just blame everything on COVID, right? Nothing works since COVID. Everything's more expensive since COVID. EpiPens are astronomically expensive now. Um, I don't think most people would want to risk losing one of those because <laughs> they're somewhere in the neighborhood, depending on where you get them, like two to three hundred dollars for an EpiPen now. So I, I write these prescriptions out routinely for my patients in my practice. And even with insurance, um, it's costing them a couple hundred bucks. So if you're super motivated, you could get a prescription with your name on it because they're going to be much less likely to take it away in that instance. If you're somebody that just happens to have a box with no prescription because you have access to, um, you know, surplus medications, things like that, um, that might be a little tricky and you lose that, you know, without a name on it, they may be more likely to take it away. If you're looking at Benadryl, you've got a couple of options. Probably the most versatile form of Benadryl that you could take would be liquid. Why? Because you can use it in both pediatric patients and adults. So it gives you a little bit more versatility with regards to um, it's use because, right, it's not just adults that have allergic reactions. Sometimes it's, you know, kids, right, peanut allergies. Um, and so you don't want to have, you know, a, a seven-year-old having an allergic reaction and all you've got is a capsule and they can't swallow a capsule. And I would um, say also capsules, if they have an airway obstruction, if their neck is swelling or throat is swelling mm -hmm. because of that allergic reaction, then the liquid may be easier to swallow than a capsule. 100%. Yep. Whether you're an adult or a kid. So that's why... I, if I was going to choose a format, I would pick the Benadryl liquid. Um, usually they'll have a measuring cap on it. And so um, there, you know, as far as dosing is concerned, you know, for adults, uh, I believe it says on the bottle, and this is fairly typical if you just do any kind of research on the internet, um, 25 to 50 milligrams of Benadryl is a fairly typical dose of Benadryl for an adult. I would probably, you know, I'd be erring on the side of the higher dose if somebody is having a true allergic type of reaction that's severe. If it's a kid, uh, 1.25 milligrams per kilogram is the dosing that we use in the emergency department. Um, so you'd have to know pounds and conversion and that sort of thing. So it gets a little bit trickier. Um, but there's a little medicine cup that comes with it that allows you to dose um, in how many cc's and that allows you to convert how many milligrams you're giving the patient. And Benadryl is an over-the-counter medicine, so there's no issues with people having it. I will mm -hmm. say that um, Benadryl is slower acting in, than epinephrine, which is why people get epinephrine. But when they get to the ED, it is essentially buying time till the Benadryl makes its way in, right? Well, yes and no. So epi is the gold standard when it comes to allergic reactions. So if somebody is having a severe allergic reaction, and what does that look like? Uh, hives all over their body. Uh, problems with their airway where they're having trouble swallowing or trouble breathing. Um, those with, you know, lips swelling up. Anything where the airway is affected, that is an, that is an anaphylactic or an allergic emergency. Um, so a little bit of itching, a little bit of scratchiness, not nearly as worrisome. Epinephrine is the gold standard because what it does is it helps to decrease all those factors of inflammation, helps to um, uh, constrict blood vessels, and that helps out with swelling, especially in the airway is really what we're worried about here. Um, Benadryl takes a long time to work along the lines of hours, and it's not nearly as effective as epinephrine. Now, if you're having a mild reaction, Benadryl is just fine. 
If you're somebody who's having a little bit of itching, uh, theoretically a little scratchiness of the throat, a little bit of like rash popping up or redness, uh, and it's mild, Benadryl will probably do the trick. Um, but if it's a severe reaction, it's, you know, it, it may not, it may not be enough, but it's certainly better than nothing. Right. So let me ask you this, not to be a pessimistic, but assuming it is more on the severe side, how much mm -hmm. time do we usually talk? Because we meet flight, right? Is this an emergency that requires an emergency landing and would give him Benadryl even assist? Yeah, no, I mean, look, if someone's having an anaphylactic reaction, um, that's, that's, you're going to have to try to find uh, an airport to land in, because if you don't, and the airway continues to narrow and occlude, um, you know, their time is limited. So that's going to be the way. And of course, we all know that the pilot can't just, you know, drop from 20 or 30,000 feet in a, in a couple minutes. This is something that's going to take some time and some doing. So yeah, it's buying time and um, giving them a higher dose of Benadryl is something that could be the difference between life or death. Thank you, Doc. So I'm moving on to the next thing that we discussed was uh, indigestion. We're talking air airport food. So that is pretty common. Um, I know I'm a big fan of Chipotle when I'm uh, a BWI before I get on a flight. So antiacids, right? And I got a bunch of these little things. I put everything in Ziploc bags just because I didn't want to put all boxes and, and containers in. So everything in Ziplocs to fit in my little Pelican case. Um, mm -hmm. But... Talk to me about that. What, uh, how much should I give? Should I give? And what am I looking for? So any, you know, what is an antacid? Basically, it is something that is made out of basic material, usually sodium bicarbonate um, or some version thereof. Tums are made of calcium uh, carbonate. It's something that is going to neutralize acid. So that's hence the name antacid. Uh, so they come in a lot of forms. There's chewable kinds. There's kinds that dissolve in water. Um, and so if somebody is having really bad indigestion, the question is, is, is it from indigestion? Is it from airport food or is it from something else? Because indigestion, uh, can be a great masquerader. And the big thing that we never want to miss with indigestion is a heart attack, right? Yep. That's a very classic, um, understated sign for people. They might, you know, they might be sitting there and sort of like rubbing their chest and, um, and saying, ah, you know, I don't feel really well. And yeah, certainly it could be from you know, something that they ate, the reality of it is you don't have an EKG when you're on an airplane. You're not going to be able to rule out a heart attack. What you can do is ask them if there are any other signs and symptoms going along with the indigestion. If it's straight up, yeah, you know what? Every time I eat tomato sauce, I get indigestion and this feels just like the reflux I've had before. Okay, I'm feeling a little bit better about the situation. If it's like, uh, no, I, this never happens to me and all of a sudden I've got indigestion and you know what? What's really weird is my left arm is feeling numb or I'm getting tingling in my jaw, or I'm feeling short of breath. Those are warning signs that something more serious could be going on, like a heart attack. So that's when you sort of might want to think about switching gears, depending on the patient's symptoms. If it's straight up indigestion, you've got a lot of things at your disposal because of the, um, the liquid issues with not being able to take a lot of liquids on. Probably taking um, chewable Tums is a good alternative. Um, those, you know, they stay good forever. Uh, people can chew them up easily. Kids can chew them up, even though kids don't get indigestion that often. Um, Alka-Seltzer Gold is another really good one, but of course you need some water to dissolve that in. It's not going to dissolve in your mouth pretty well. So I just say stick with the chewables. Tums is, you know, for this situation is probably sufficient. Perfect. So uh, that's actually what I got following our conversation because I never had indigestion before, so I never had Tums around. So now I do. Uh, but you bring up a great point. So now you're talking about a cardiac issue. And actually, the one flight that Steve and I was, that was an international flight. Uh, to tell the story, we were called in. Uh, Steve actually didn't come with me to that patient. One of our other friends was a paramedic in uh, D.C. Metro uh, came with me. Um, and to just to highlight a little bit about uh, and you know, I... Uh, I love you, and, and, I, and I think you're the greatest on everything, but not all doctors are like you. And we get there. There's this one physician there, and the guy's always in distress, and you can see him, they're pale, and they're sweating. Um, and and I, I asked the person, was the physician, he's like, did you take a heart rate? Did you feel up? Is it normal? Can you feel it? So basic stuff that we would do as medics when we come to the scene, and the answers are no, 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 no medical history taken, nothing. So I asked, what kind of doctor are you? And he goes, I'm a gynecologist. I'm like, well, this does not look like a vagina. And <laughs> let, us, let, let us take over. So, you know, being a physician doesn't always make you the highest trained medical professional on the scene, depending on 
So this guy's probably never dealt or hasn't dealt with a cardiac issue in the past 20 years. So it was pretty interesting. Uh, but we were lucky that we had aspirin uh, with us, uh, baby aspirin, and one of the other people on board at uh, Nitro. And the guy did have a history of cardiac issues, and that seemed to stabilize things that we landed in uh, Frankfurt. Uh, so following our conversation, I went and... Uh, re up my supply of the baby aspirin. So talk to us about that. What's uh, the benefits of having that? Yeah, great question. So aspirin obviously is over the counter, easy to carry. Uh, generally carrying chewable baby aspirins is best, again, um, depending on mental status of the patient um, and, and just ease of use. Uh, generally speaking, in the emergency department, if somebody comes in with chest pain, we're going to have them start chewing on baby aspirin. And the standard dose is usually anywhere from you know, 81 milligrams to 325 milligrams. The literature is all over the place with this. We're usually giving them like two baby aspirins to four baby aspirins. And I don't think there is anything that says that's written in stone that you have to give one versus the other. What does aspirin do? It has an effect on platelets. Platelets are the portion of your blood. It does a lot. They actually do quite a few different things, but they do. Um, when there is a problem, they can get very sticky and start to clump together. And with a heart attack, we're assuming that there is a blood clot that's blocking blood flow to a part of the heart. So what we're trying to do is make the blood less sticky, uh, which will make the clot less sticky and will enable us to treat somebody that has some sort of blockage. So that's been borne out pretty well in the literature that it is something that is very useful for increasing survival rates and decreasing um, bad outcomes with heart attacks. So we universally will give folks aspirin. What would be a reason to give it versus not giving it? Well, for starters, if somebody, anytime you're giving anybody anything, you always want to ask them, are you allergic to anything? All right. It's, you know, you don't want to ask them that after they're chewing on the baby aspirin and you find out <laughs> that they're allergic to it. So when, like you said, you know, taking a basic medical history on these folks is going to be crucial. That includes medications that they're on, allergies that they have. Um, so it, the only real contraindication is somebody who has a true allergy to aspirin. If they do, well, then you're just going to forego that step. Um, you know, is it really because you talk about an allergic reaction to aspirin? Is the does the good not outweigh the bad in this case? All depends. So if they tell you that you know when they when they've had it in the past, they get stomach upset. Well, that's not truly an allergy because aspirin can irritate your stomach, and people will commonly say, "Oh yeah, I take aspirin; it causes me to have a stomach ache." But if they tell you that they get hives. Uh, then I probably would not be giving it to them because each time somebody experiences an allergic reaction, what, what can happen is the subsequent reactions can ramp up and be more severe. So somebody who got hives the first time might have a full-blown anaphylactic reaction with airway compromise the second time. So I would sort of gauge the seriousness of it, and clearly that's more of a higher-level thing. Um, so it, the reality is, is if somebody says I have a rea you know an allergic reaction and it sounds like anything serious, probably just best to err on the side of caution um, because while it's very helpful, again, you don't want to worsen the situation, you know, if, if possible. Most people, that's a very rare thing, to be honest. Um, the, the other question that often comes up, what if they're on a blood thinner? What if they're on Coumadin or Plavix or some of these other uh, blood thinners that people are on for various reasons? Again, not a contraindication. Certainly one dose of aspirin, um, taken in conjunction with any of these medications is not going to be a problem for the for the patient and we're not getting into nitro here but also if they come back from vegas you got to check if they've taken any kind of erectile dysfunction medication prior to uh just to be aware of the counteractions of that <laughs> just saying because some of us are going to vegas and you know we're in the 40s <laughs> steve is not getting any nitro that's for certain that uh, is for certain absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, the only other case that we discussed, other potential issue in the plane during a phone conversation was potential seizures. Unexpected. Some people get them without knowing that they had any prior history or potential of having them. They can come out of the blue. There's typically a trigger, something that causes it, but they may not even know it. Um, and if they have a seizure, the, the solution is just make sure they're safe. They don't hit their head on anything that can harm them any worse. Make sure the airway remains open. That's where that NPA and OPA come in, assuming that you can get it in. Don't touch them during a seizure, right? Let them go through that grand mile and, and get it out of their system and then make sure that they're breathing all right. Am, am I missing anything on that one? 
No, I think you're right on the money. If somebody is sitting in their seat and they have a seat belt on, the chance of them hurting themselves is exceedingly slim. So if they are seizing and you come upon this, I would just sort of let it ride out. Um, if, if there was some vomitus where they had food in their mouth when they were experiencing a seizure, um, you can put them in what's called the recovery position, which is turning them on their side, which would allow gravity to let some of the fluids come out of their mouth and some of the solids theoretically. Um, if somebody were standing or were walking in an aisle, for instance, when this happened, trying to safely get them to the ground and make sure that they don't hit their head on the way down is going to be what you're going to be aiming for. I would not be trying to put anything in their mouth. That's like a common thing that you see in the movies. People are stuffing like gloves and tongue Stitched. depressors and all this, yeah, <laughs> all this weird stuff. And all it does is it breaks their teeth and like becomes an airway problem. Um, so what you don't want to do is, is shove things in their mouth. Um, but really just keeping them safe and making sure that they don't experience any trauma on the way down is, is your main goal. Most seizures will stop on their own um, in a period of under 15 minutes. Most of them, quite frankly, last just a matter of minutes, although it can seem like hours when you're, you know, when you're experiencing something like that. Perfect. So any, any other, those are the ones that we discussed. And, and again, we were on the phone for a while and I, I, I love those conversations, but is there anything else that our listeners should be aware of is there anything that they can do preventatively or something that they should do um just to be ready and prepared to such event god forbid one of those happen right again you know a lot of this comes down to um just trying to make sure that you're not doing any harm like you don't want to do things that are you know way above what you feel comfortable doing or that you haven't been trained to do i think one of the things you and i talked about was nosebleeds um Oh, That's yeah. obviously something that can happen. The air is very dry in the cabin. Um, you know, most of the time, it, it seems like everybody is sick on a plane. So when you're sick, your nasal passageways tend to be quite irritated. And then uh, if somebody's on blood thinners or something like that, it could just predispose to nosebleeds. So uh, we talked about you having a blowout kit, a trauma kit. And one of the things that's in there is, um, you know, quick clot is something that you have. But um, do you have any heme con in your... Um, in your kit? And come uh, as a different just another, standalone hemostatic agent? Yeah, it's just another hemostatic. They, they would make them um, in uh, um, foam pads. But if you had, for instance, the Z folded no, yep. combat gauze. That's what I have. Yeah, so that, that generally has, a, I think, that has zeolite um, as the agent. So you can, so if you had somebody with a nosebleed, first of all, before you start getting all fancy with putting um, you know, <laughs> stuff in combat gauze in there. The, the easiest thing is just take their nose and you just pinch it really hard and you hold it for about five to 10 minutes without letting go. Um, everybody wants to see, did the bleeding stop? Did the bleeding stop? And they keep letting go. Uh, the, the trick is to not let go. And so what you can do is just for 10 minutes, hold it as tight as you can and then really let the patient hold it is what I always do. Like I pinch it really hard to demonstrate where I want them to hold and the best place is right above the, the soft part of the nair is right here because that corresponds with the part of your nose where the typical nosebleeds will happen. It's called Little's area. It's where the, the uh, tissue is really thin and the blood vessels are close to the surface, so it tends to bleed easier. So what you'll have them do is you just pinch it really hard. Um, pressure usually will stop, uh, I would say, probably 99% of nosebleeds. And if they do that, that'll solve the problem. You don't have to do all kinds of weird things like putting ice on their face and um, putting tissues under their nose. None of that stuff really works. It's the I like pressure. sticking tampons in there. I don't know that it does much, but it looks funny when the string is hanging out. Oh, it's hilarious. But, right. you know, um, I, I didn't realize you carried tampons in your in your uh, carry-on bag. BK. Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> so there are um, there are commercial products that you can get. There's something called a Rhino Rocket. Um <laughs> which is something that we use in the, believe it or not, we use it in the ER. But um, if you had nothing more than um, gauze, right? It doesn't even have to be combat gauze. If you put that inside the nose, the packing in and of itself will compress the blood vessels and that can do a pretty decent job of, um, of stopping a nosebleed. If you didn't have gauze, you could take tissues and you can stuff those in there. And what you're doing is you're essentially packing it like you would pack a wound in a trauma patient. Um, and the, the tissue, again, will create pressure and that will push up against the blood vessel and stop the bleeding. So most of the time, you don't have to get that fancy. Um, but if you, for instance, had a bottle of Afrin, let's say, because you happen to have nasal congestion, 
Um, afrin is a nice vasoconstrictor. So spraying some afrin in the nose is another thing that can constrict those blood vessels and stop a nosebleed. So that's another little nifty thing that you can have on hand. Okay, perfect. And would that help with any kind of allergic related nasal issue? Probably not, um, because generally speaking, with allergic reactions, they're not getting a tremendous amount of swelling in the nose. It's you're really worried about swelling down in the lower portion of the airway, um, and and unfortunately, Afrin won't do much for that. But you know, cool. it will help out with the nosebleed. Awesome. So, I think uh, now that we're better prepared, because it was funny when well, not funny, funny, but when Steve and I were to fly, we we realized we both carry our our booba kits, we are tourniquets and chest seal and all that's all good. So the only thing I can carry is a uh, needle decompression kit. Uh, but we were very unprepared for a medical emergency and I don't like being unprepared. So I, uh, I appreciate your time. And, and I know this is not what you do nowadays. Um, and just so people know, Eric, aside from being an optimized performance physician, is my primary care physician. He does everything. So uh, do you want to let people know where they can get a hold of you in case anybody wants to? Sure, sure. So my practice is called Opti Health Institute. And uh, essentially, I'm a functional medicine doctor. And what does that mean? It just means that my whole philosophy is looking at the root cause of illness. So when somebody comes in and they have a particular complaint or a symptom, rather than uh, writing a prescription to cover up what the symptom is, I try to get to the root cause of the illness. And many times that fixes the, the problem. So that can be everything from thyroid health to gut health to hormones, uh, sleep, nutrition, everything that, that goes into sort of optimizing somebody's overall health. So it's a little bit different than the emergency department, but it's, it's sort of the second half of my career. And it's, uh, it's, it's a really wonderful time and um, definitely a great transition. I, I think the best way you ever described it to me is when you told me that you got tired of being reactive and you wanted to be proactive and prevent people from being sick to begin with. And I thought that was awesome. Um, so Eric, I, I, you know, aside from, I, I keep calling you Eric cause you're a close friend, but Dr. Nager, uh, I, I truly appreciate you joining us today and, you know, helping us through this process and thank you. Well, I'm My not pleasure. Not that easy. I'm not doing trivia questions anymore. Oh, you what happened to that? Right. What are we doing with that? We got to do well, trivia I, questions. No, I can prepare. Don't worry. I got a couple questions for the good old doc. And right. I'm not your patient yet. I'm being lazy, although I'm seeing your neighbors downstairs. Right. Yeah, he makes it all the way to your building and he stops at the right. base floor. He's you been know? telling me this for a year. I got to see you. I got to see you. I got to see you. I but do. it's okay. So I think he's afraid. Reasons. I think he's but, afraid. Look, first I got to rehabilitate myself and be able to walk and bend over before I can go see Dr. Nager. So <laughs> I'm downstairs getting my the, the, the physical side fixed so I can get the internal fix with Dr. Nager. But anyway, I'm gonna hit you with a couple questions just because sure. you know not you know a little, little fun I, off the wall, no theme, no topics. I'm just throwing it out there. All right. And the first question for you is no challenge. It's just fun questions, you know, for, for our viewers to you know, uh, listen to, and you try to ask, I guess this is medical, but really not, but it has to do with human anatomy. What is the space between your eyebrows called? What if you don't have a space between your eyebrows? You obviously do. All right. Well, the some people have a uni bra. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as, as is par for the course, Steve, you've got me stumped. So hit me. The glabella. The glabella, okay. I like, you know, your elbows, the weenus. That's the, okay. the the glabella. Yes. If you had asked me what the space between the genitals and the anus was, I probably could have answered that. But okay, yeah, there's like a thousand names for that. I call That's it yes. a taint. <laughs> I call it, she calls it a taint. <laughs> All, All right. right. Wait a second. What's what's your, isn't it the perineum? Perineum. Yeah. All right, yeah. I got that right. It's a gooch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. The plastic or metallic, this is an easy one. I knew this, and I don't know why I know it, but I know a bunch of dumb shit anyway. Yeah, uh, the, I annoy BK regularly with my useless knowledge. The plastic or metallic coating at the end of your shoelace is called a what? Uh, grommet? No. no grommet uh, let is me where the shoelace goes through. Through, yes. Okay, let's see. Hold on. I remember this from when I was a kid, but Starts I don't with remember. An a. It. Starts with an A. Starts with an A? Yes. I keep I keep wanting to say areola, but I know that's not it. <laughs> um, 
you couldn't ask me something easy like what's my favorite bourbon but okay what what's the answer aglet aglet okay hold on doc doc what's your favorite bourbon i'm kind of intrigued uh i really like whistle pig i like them all i don't know that i had whistle pig i'll be whistle honest. pig is uh ma mainly a rye um but that's that's sort of my favorite um i do like uh woodford reserve um, as an all-purpose all one, um, but yeah, I've been I've been uh, playing with a lot of different bourbons. I do like Whistle Pig, so I could have answered that, or if you could have asked me my favorite caliber of you know, handgun <laughs> ammunition. One more. I'll give you one more. One more. I'll give you a chance. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> and I know you're not going to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it. The prongs on a fork are called what? Tines. You got it. Ah, oh, why thank they, goodness. Why are they called? Tines. One out of three. I'm full of so many useless factoids. It's amazing that there That's are some that pretty good. Right, do I don't know. Just, just because. The day, All right, after, go for it. the day after tomorrow is called what? Thursday? Um, bo boxing Day? <laughs> We're recording this on a Tuesday. <laughs> Overmorrow. What? what is it? Overmorrow? Overmorrow. Okay. Huh. Overmorrow. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you. Yeah, we're gonna you stop can go all here. night. <laughs> <laughs> but you know right. what? He got times. Many people don't know that. That's a good one. No, I did not know that. Um, Doc, be safe driving home. Thank you for stopping on the side of the road to chat with us. Uh, even though we had some uh, audio difficulties, I'm glad we made it work. Um, this was super interesting to me. I know a lot yeah. of our listeners are into this kind of stuff I, as well. I learned quite a few things from you, Doc, on this one. So I'm thankful. And I built a kid out of it. I'm going to uh, SHOT Show in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to have that kid on me. So, Because God yeah, knows coming back from that. Vegas. You'll be stabbing me in my ass here soon as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Have a nice good night. night. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this latest episode. Please go ahead, subscribe to our podcast, and leave us a like. Check out our YouTube channel as well if you haven't yet, and follow us on our social media channels. Instagram, it's silver underscore savage 45, Facebook, and obviously our website, silver-savage 45.